Thank you so much for joining me today in this presentation. Please remember to visit editstock.com to pick up a project for your students to re-edit and visit editmentor.com for your chance to win a free practice project for your students, but also to have one of your projects reviewed by me. And you could be lucky enough to join the Edit Mentor beta program. You know, I've explored the craft of editing for nearly 20 years, and it's been my pleasure to share with you. Please keep in touch with me. You can email me at misha at editstock.com anytime. And now I'm happy to answer any questions you might have. So thank you again. What's up, everybody? If you are here, I'm going to give some people, thank you. I'm going to give some people some time to show up before I start answering your, your questions. <clears throat> and if you have one, of course, type it into the box. I've written a few myself. If you're here, say hello. Tell me where you're writing from. I'm in North Hollywood, California. You are in my kitchen, <laughs> basically my kitchen. And uh, I really loved this presentation that, um, that I gave. I started with something a little scary because it was supposed to be presented on Friday the 13th. So that's why we started with careful with that power tool. Um, why did the character? Why did the director have the boy fall off the bike in the first film? I love that we now have our first question. So, in the beginning of any movie, you need to set up rules for the movie, and these are rules that the audience doesn't know yet. Otherwise, the audience is going to assume that the world is the same as their own. So, for example, if uh, you are making a magical world and you show a witch fly by on her broom, then we now know that in the world of this movie, witches can fly on brooms, right? So when you show someone, when you, when the director here showed the boy falling off the bike in the beginning of the movie, the goal was to show that the boy is clumsy. I mean, that's the whole, that's the whole point. So all the things that the director did, all those little details, he runs by the nail, he's barefoot, there's, you know, it's a dangerous place, he plays with all these other toys. The, the whole point of all that stuff was to set up how dangerous the location is and how clumsy or like threatened the boy is. Hi, young journalist from Florida and West Palm Beach. And let's see. So uh, I'm going to, I'm going to answer a question that I saw in the chat during the live video that I really loved. And it was, if you are Christopher Nolan, you can have like, if there's a beginning, an end, a, a middle, a past, a future, right? And um, this idea actually started being pressed back um, in the 50s by French filmmakers, which is really interesting because, like I said, rule number 10 was all these rules can change and they didn't come out of nowhere. So there's a really famous director named uh, Jean-Luc Godard. And he said, a story should have a beginning, a middle and an end, but not necessarily in that order. <laughs> I really love that because you can break all these rules, but you just have to understand them. You know, We have to know that the main character is gonna go on a quest and we have to know why they're on that quest and what they're trying to accomplish. But like, if you remember the movie Memento, it kind of works backwards. The character learns what his quest is sort of towards the end of his quest. And, um, and but it is still important that they have a quest. Uh, one second as I sort of turn off the edit stock chat. Hopefully you're not hearing too much of that beeping. Uh, hello from Amsterdam. The bigger the blank, the better. So basically, the bigger the obstacle, the bigger the obstacle, the better. And the bigger the change, the better. We want, um, we want our characters to have a really tough time achieving their goals because the harder it is for them, 
the more we will see them uh, change and we'll see their emotions come out. Um, actually, recently, a really great editor told me this really great um, rule of thumb, which is like all movies or 90% of movies are Cinderella. And what he meant by that was that um, movies are, are one of two ways. It's either the main character, everything in their life was terrible. And now they have this opportunity to change. Something amazing happened. They have this opportunity to change. That's Cinderella. Or um, everything is wonderful. And then something bad happens and it forces them to change. But the, the change is required. Uh, let's see. What's the most common way to isolate your senses? So I can tell you guys are doing the worksheet and that's great. The most common way is to turn off the sound and just watch the picture. And if you've never done that before, it is an eye-opening, no pun intended, experience. When you turn the sound off and you're only looking at the picture, you're not being manipulated by the music or some uh, sound effects or visual, well, visual effects, I guess you are being manipulated by, but you are, you're, you're creating a little story in your head. In fact, when I'm editing something that's like an action scene, I will usually, I'll say out loud, like the good guy is winning, the good guy is winning, but the bad guy fights back. And I'll, I'll, the reason I say that out loud is because it gives every shot a little meaning to it. So it's like one punch where the good guy connects, I'll say the good guy's winning, you know, because that's the story I'm trying to tell. But if you have like the music in there, you might get wrapped up in some montage or some, um, some crescendo, some, something about the editing, like a pacing or trick of the editing that is confusing you with thinking that your story is going well. And let's see. So an, another um, question that I saw in there is, uh, you know, but I, it's, uh, I said no voiceover ever. And someone wrote in the comments, but I see voiceover in professional films all the time. In fact, I watched one, a film yesterday with my wife called Molly's Game on Netflix. And it was written by Aaron Sorkin, who is a two-time Oscar-winning writer. Um, and he's the, the director of this project. And it uh, had lots of voiceover, like half the movie was voiceover. So I would never tell um, Aaron Sorkin he can't have voiceover, but I will tell all of you high school kids, you cannot have voiceover. And it's like, uh, it, it's, it's more about because the rule you guys need to learn is to show your story, you know, really show it. It's so easy to just say it, to just say, uh, you know, these are dangerous times we live in. But it's another thing to put that on screen and show it without saying it. And that's really what separates sort of, um, you know, okay from good filmmaking. Another uh, question I saw is that, um, you know, why were we watching middle school movies? And I think that it's important for you guys to know, you know, I judge a lot of film competitions. I judge very big ones in the United States where movies are submitted that cost tons of money to make, million dollars to make. And I judge college movies and I judge high school movies and some middle school kids. In fact, this is, STN is the only middle school uh, competition uh, that I judge. And the reason um, that I put those movies there isn't because they're high school movies or college movies or middle school movies. It's because they're good movies. You know, you don't need a degree from, I mean, go to college, but you don't need a degree from college to make a movie. You just need to pick up the camera and go shoot something. And I think that there's a lot of um, people out there who think that like, because you're older, you're naturally just better at making movies and you're not, you know, a lot of college kids really struggle with some of these, some of these concepts, like a beginning, a middle and an end. Um, let's see what we've got here. Another question coming in. What's the best way to test your editing to make sure what you intend comes across? The best way is to do what's called screening. Um, a screening, a movie, 
is when you show it to people that you don't know or that you know will tell you the truth. So not your mom and dad, not your, you should show your teacher, um, but not maybe like your best friend in the class or like your boyfriend or girlfriend. You should show a room of like 10 of your friends and you should give them a worksheet and the worksheet should say on it, um, what was the main character's quest? What was the thing you liked the most? What was the th what was something that was not clear to you? And you would be amazed at how much you learn from those uh, screenings. In fact, every every professional movie I've ever worked on does screenings. Um, sometimes in a theater where you actually uh, we you hire someone to to give away tickets to the movie out front, and then you literally pack a theater filled with people you don't know at all. And they don't even know that the filmmakers are sitting in the room watching the movie with them. In fact, you as a filmmaker will get a feeling in your body when the audience isn't understanding something. You will just know. There's like a group intuition. Do I prefer silent films or films with audio? I prefer films with audio. <laughs> what am I? It's not 1920 anymore. But I do think that you guys should all make a silent movie because it's an excellent exercise. You know, a silent movie, when you're making a silent movie, the only thing you can do is show your audience your story. Don't use title cards. That's cheating. Just show them what's happening. You know, place the camera in the right place to tell your story. Um, how many plot twists are acceptable in a short um, movie? You can have 100 plot twists. What you don't want to have, there are two things you don't want to have. One is confusion. Okay. Your movie cannot end on confusion because the audience will leave feeling unsatisfied. It's like going to a restaurant, like ordering something that never, and then they bring you something else. Okay. The, the other thing is um, you don't want to have anything that is a setup without a payoff. And sometimes this is called Chekhov's gun. Chekhov's gun is a storytelling principle that's like, if you show a gun in the first scene, then by the end of the movie, that gun better be picked up by one of the characters and used. You know, you, you're going to shoot it or you're going to brandish it or whatever. But you don't want to show the gun and hint to your audience something and then cheat and tell them that it never happened. Um, so one problem that people run into a lot with twists, and I think we saw this in that movie Stalker is that they make a twist just to do something different, just to like, aha, I got you. But just like what happened in Stalker, if the audience is confused, they're, they're not going to like it. And again, that's not to say Stalker was a bad movie. It was not. This is the question that everybody seems to be getting stuck on. The bigger the blank, the better the blank. Um, the bigger the obstacle, um, well... I actually need to look back and watch, rewatch my own video. Um, but basically, the bigger the obstacle, the bigger the change is um, what I think that that movie means. Uh, what's the post-production role one-shot movies such as 1917? I'm not sure I understand that question. What's the post-production role in one-shot movies such as 1917? So let's see what... 1917, one shot movie. Are you saying a movie that was all shot in one take? Oh, okay, yeah. Acclaimed war movie, 1917, looks like the entire movie occurs in a single take. First of all, I am telling you 100% certainty that that movie was not filmed in a single take. It wasn't. <laughs> it was not. I made a TV show that none of you guys are old enough to watch on Cinemax called um, called Quarry, like Rock Quarry. And there was a scene that was something like nine minutes long, and it was all one shot. But it's actually a combination of a lot of shots. In fact, the beginning of Gravity was all one shot. Um, Birdman was all one shot. And no, in none of these cases is the movie all one shot. And even still, you can cut little pieces out in between and add little transitions that um, are called morph effects that makes 
make something look like it was one shot when really it was two. You can even take out space between a character's dialogue. Uh, let's see. Yeah, the bigger the change, the better the movie. That's the that's the answer to that question with the two blanks. 1917 won best visual effects, and I totally understand how that's possible. Audio is a struggle for student filmmakers. Yeah, it is. Always. Any tips on how the students can mix their audio levels for acceptable levels? The they students screw this up in two places. The first place is they don't wear headphones while they're filming. Wearing headphones will let you hear when something's distorted. Most students sort of assume everything is going to plan. The second place that they make mistakes is in the editing room. You, you need to make sure that it's not how loud your speakers are turned up, it's your audio meter. Your audio meter is your objective um, volume range. You never want it to be touching the red. You usually want it to be about minus six decibel levels. At minus six decibel level, you're pretty safe. You know, you're not gonna blow out anyone's speakers. Can I explain to find a problem, isolate your senses? Yes, this seems to be one that I think students are struggling with because this is, uh, you're not the first person to ask that question. Um, several people did. Isolating, so you have, you know, you can touch, you can smell, you can taste, right? You're a human being with multiple senses. So that those are your senses, okay? Your eyes and your ears are the two most important senses for a movie, unless arguably like sitting in a comfortable place is also important. Um, the problem is that sometimes if our music is really good, we think that that means our story is really good. And, um, and vice versa. If our video is really good, we think our like sound is perfect. And so when you turn one of those things off, it focuses your attention a lot more in one place. Um, the most common way to do this is turn off the sound while you're editing and rewatch your project. That will give you a feeling of pace and it will tell you if your shots make sense. You'll also be able to find things like the camera was too shaky or I should trim off the end of this shot because the camera fell off the tripod. Uh, tripod. A lot of uh, students make that mistake. Let me see. I noticed that you're all getting punished for this. I noticed a lot of people making comments about a movie, uh, about the movies they were watching. And... Um, I want to, all, all the movies have problems with them, of course. All the high school and middle school movies have problems with them. Um, and of course, you know, we criticized Gravity and Gravity won the Oscar for best picture. So yeah, we it it's easy to criticize. And I criticize, um, all people criticize. It's a natural state of human beings. You know, it's to analyze and break things down and criticize. But I encourage you guys to all remember that you're all learning and to uh, lift each other up because it is much easier to criticize than it is to create. So make sure you're all creating. Um, I can never come up with ideas for films. So how can we come up with the ideas? Do you have any suggestions? Uh, yes, I have suggestions. And first of all, I wanna say, I never come up with ideas for movies either. That's one of the things that I like about editing is I never have to come up with the idea for the movie. Um, write, coming up with the idea for a movie and writing it and directing it and blocking it and all of the things that go into production is insanely hard, insanely hard. And I think, you know, it, so storytelling, you know, everyone can do, we can all do it. But to physically sit down, I mean, if you guys have ever sat down, try to write a 30 page script, like good luck. That is that is a challenge. Um, but there was something I was, oh, but how do we come up with ideas for movies? So you want to start by, um, first of all, throw away anything that like your teacher tells you is a good idea. <laughs> Sorry, teachers. Throw away everything your teacher says is a good idea. 
don't make me a don't smoke video. Don't make me a don't drink and drive movie. Don't make me a movie about say no to drugs. Don't make me a movie about wearing your seatbelt. Um, you can make PSAs for that. And it makes sense when STN has like a PSA contest to do that. But movies don't have to be about anything. They don't have, or they, I'm sorry, they have to be about something, but they don't have to have a moral to them. They don't have to teach me something. They don't have to uh, let me understand that life is actually better or this way or that way. Um, movies are, it's just a story, you know, it's just trying to get a feeling out of someone. And, um, I encourage you guys that some of the movies that I like the most that you guys make are just the ones about your regular life. You know, instead of making a movie about, um, that people shouldn't bully each other, make a PSA about how people shouldn't bully each other, but show me the, the wonderful, diverse lives that you live. And, um, you know, something just like, what do you turn to your friends and say to them, I had something funny happened or something scary happened. Like those things are good movies. If it's a story you want to tell your friend, that's a good, that's a good movie. And then you should write down your ideas and just the, whatever the top two or three are, just throw them away immediately because they're almost always going to be cliches. Um, we did this. Um, I taught a class a while back and we walked around to each student and had them describe what obstacles, um, what obstacles their characters should go to go through. And a lot of the class, no matter what the plot was, the students had the same obstacles. And I just, you know, like never make a movie about, I don't have enough money because it's like, it's a dumb obstacle. Like come up with something more creative than that. A PSA is a public service announcement. And it's uh, sort of like a commercial, but it uh, makes you feel good. Um, Yashi, you're going to get banned here in a second. And removed. There, that's your warning shot. Next time you're, you're getting removed. Let's see. Um, by the way, the answers to the STN workshop worksheet are all in the video that you just watched. So go back and watch it again. This is a great point by Scott Wood. You should also make radio story without pictures. It, not only is that a good idea, but I sometimes call my first pass of a documentary the radio edit um, because all that I'm thinking about is just the sound. This is another really great way to isolate your senses, like what we were talking about earlier. You can, um, you just listen to the voices that your characters are, or not your characters, your uh, talking head interviews are saying, and you edit those and you rework them and you put them in the right order. And you think about, do I really need that section? Do I really need that section? And when you have a good radio story, meaning you could play it, listen to it, not watch it and understand what the story is. That's when it's time to start putting the picture on top. Can I talk about rhythm and pacing? Yes. I'm going to talk about rhythm and pacing and it coincides with a question I saw in the chat during the presentation, which is, is this presentation even about editing? You didn't talk for a second about like, I should trim one clip longer than the other, or I should, um, you know, how do I make an effect or how do I add a sound design or something like that? And I just want to tell you, first of all, those things, they go on top of a story. But the part that you guys struggle with the most in the videos that I watch from STN is the concept of like having a beginning, a middle and an end or taking out the voiceover, right? These are things that um, are going to be editorial decisions. Certainly voiceover is an editorial decision. It's not as flashy as how do I make a montage or like a nine camera insert thing. But when you watch most TV shows, you don't see that stuff anyway. You know, what you're really seeing is really, really clever storytelling. And that is what separates sort of the, uh, the, the great from the okay. Um, can I talk about rhythm and pacing? You know, that, um, so I'm coming back to that same question. That is um, a challenge. 
and for newer editors especially, your internal pacing is usually off a little bit. Uh, usually it's too slow. And usually it's like too slow, too slow, and then the occasional shot that's way, 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 way too fast. Like it's half a second and it should be a second and a half. Um, that comes with practice. It comes, it really just, that's it. It just comes with practice. Um, you need to cut, especially dialogue, typically slightly uh, comedy, slightly faster than you think and dramatic moments a little slower um, than you think. Um, the other thing, the last thing I'll kind of say about rhythm and pacing is just a lot of people will sort of, especially in a scripted project, will just sort of put down a song and then edit the video to match the song. But in a scripted project, it kind of goes the other way. You want to make the pacing of the story first, and then you force the music to match the pacing of the story. In a montage, the pacing of the story is set by the music. So a montage would be a flashback, a dream, a drug trip. Those things are non-real time. And so those things need some sort of bone structure to support um, the footage that you're putting on top. And so oftentimes that bone structure is the music. Um, can I please explain shooting ratio? Shooting uh, ratio is the amount of footage you have versus the amount of finished product. So if you have a 10 minute raw, 10 minutes of raw footage, and from that you're supposed to make a one minute video, your shooting ratio is 10 to one. Shooting ratios have increased a lot. And that's because in the old days you shot on film and film was expensive, but now you guys are shooting digitally. So um, you have basically unlimited footage. Um, so shooting ratios are going up. I mean, to a crazy, to a crazy amount. Okay, uh, will the slides be available for teachers? Yes, they are. I think I sent them to Nick uh, from STN. And if you're listening in, Nick, please do share the slides with teachers. What are some tricks to capture people's personalities like in the Pink Helmet Posse? Um, you have to look at the people and think about them. And this is that's kind of the main point of what Steve Audette was saying. He, he said, and I'm not sure if I had a slide for this, but he said, the truth is in the footage. You go in, and actually this is the thing that that STN recap did so wrong in, in my opinion. And I'm not, again, not saying it's bad. It wasn't a bad video or anything, but what I felt that the student did was they wrote the script and then went out and shot the footage you know, just to put on top of the script, but the script was never going to change. You know, the script was the script. And really your job as a documentarian or as a news reporter is not to really tell us what you think at all. It's to show us what happened. Okay. So, so that means that the truth of what happened, it's in the footage. So you need to watch the footage and analyze it and really think to yourself, not I want it to be this way or that way, or I want to tell you about how the world is changing or how it affects my generation. What, you, what you're saying is these kids did this thing, right? That's what, um, that's what you're trying to do. Listen to the footage. And, and that is a lifelong quest, you know, how to listen to the footage better. Some, some students are much better, some, not students, what am I saying? Professionals, some professionals are much better at it than others. Actually, I think that might be the separating factor between sort of great editors and average editors. Um, I worked at a reality TV place for a while, and I'm just telling you, reality TV editors are the best editors, or they're among, certainly among the best editors because they take nothing, I mean, really nothing, and uh, turn it into something. And the way that they do that is they just really peer into that footage. Uh, let's see. Pick someone else's movie. Change two things. 
Interesting. I'm not sure what that <laughs> means exactly. What do I think about freelance jobs for editors? Um, they're important and pretty much all editors also freelance, whether no matter what level they're at, the nature of being an editor as a profession, as a career involves a lot of going out and finding clients and um, negotiating deals and projects that start and stop or get delayed. You really should, if, if you're considering a career as an editor, you really all do need to um, also think of yourself as an entrepreneur or like a business person because you will need to learn networking and how to build your resume and a portfolio, how to market yourself. And I don't mean by buying Facebook ads. I mean how to present yourself to your potential customer. Um, that's really different than when you work at a facility as an editor. Um, this question is, of course, about freelancing. So as a staff editor, a lot of people that I know who are staff editors haven't built a resume in, in 10 years because no one's asking for it. But when you're a freelance editor, you sort of live and die by your portfolio, which is one of the things that EditStock actually solves because you can use EditStock projects on your portfolio. Okay, I'm starting to feel like the questions are slowing down. So I'm gonna give people another minute to, answer, to ask any questions as I scroll back through and see if I sort of missed anything. Um, I want to, can anyone answer the question? When does a character run into an obstacle? What's an obstacle? An obstacle is a challenge that the character runs into during their quest. Okay, uh, I guess I'll leave you with um, how do you find, create music that fits your scene? Actually, editing music is just as important as editing um, the footage. Too many people, especially high school students, just sort of take the song, lay it in, and think that that's, that's it, you're done. But you need to learn how to trim your music, how to you know adjust pieces of it so that it fits your story. You know, great editors, command the material they um they don't just do whatever the, you know the material it's like oh the song's three minutes long and my video is two minutes long better make my song my video three minutes long because the song is in control it's not you know you're always in control um i want okay so let's see what's your opinion on adobe avid certification is it useful um, I got my one of my early jobs, maybe even a, a few of my early jobs, because I was a certified um, AVID certified user and a Final Cut Pro certified instructor. So yes, I do think certification is important. I think it's important also not to become dogmatic about what software you edit with, because as has happened a few times now in my career, it will change. It will change in your career. You know, if Adobe Premiere disappears tomorrow, it wouldn't surprise me because it's entirely possible. You know, if Final Cut Pro disappears tomorrow, it could happen. If DaVinci Resolve all of a sudden costs $10,000, it could happen. You know, those companies are uh, trying to create the most profitable situation for themselves. And the minute that that changes, so will their product offering. And that's as it should be. Uh, but I'm just warning you not to be dogmatic. But yes, the um, the idea of certification is important. Okay, what books do I recommend? I highly recommend um, David Mamet's On Directing because he taught. It's it's not about editing actually. It's about storytelling, um, and that's what you really need to like internalize. If you want a book about editing, Steve Hallfish has one. Hullfish. Um, and yes, his name is actually called Hullfish, H-U-L-L-F-I-S-H, -L -L like the bottom of a boat with a fish on it. And his book is called uh, The Art of the Cut, Conversations with Film and TV Editors. 
Steve has interviewed every editor from every movie you've ever heard of. And um, I mean, you, you're going to hear advice and opinions directly from the horse's mouth. I mean, directly from the editors um, who make those movies. And I also recommend Save the Cat, which someone um, mentioned in the chat earlier. That is a book about screenwriting. But you will find some of the lessons I talked about uh, from that book. Okay, you guys, it's been, oh, I want to leave you with one last thought. During Enhance It, a couple of people were like, there's no way you can take two pixels and make 400 out of them. Um, that is increasingly becoming possible. And I encourage you to watch this video. Let's see. I'm looking for it right now. I'm not sure if I can share this link with you, but the name of the the name of the video is called Arrival of a Train at La Coyat. And this movie is from 1896. And it was recently uprezzed by an AI machine um, to 4K. So machine learning, you guys, you have you all have such a blind spot to what machine learning will be bringing to editing in the future. Uh, machine learning means, you know, your your foot, your rough assembly could be done automatically with the press of a button. You know, your dial, your um, video can be edited by text the way that you would edit an email, and then you press assemble, and the movie will just be put it put together like that. Now, it will never replace human editors because humans make movies for other humans. And so there's no, you know, uh, a machine's not going to replace that anytime soon. But it is, but AI or more specifically learning machines like Adobe Sensei are going to, and already are, uh, going to become more and more important um, in editing. Okay. Thank you so much, everyone, for joining me. This was a blast. And I really missed you at STN um, in Washington, D.C., but I'm telling you, I will be back, and I look forward to shaking all of your hands and saying hello in person. Thank you so much. Have a good one.